Prior to the Glazers buying Man United back in 2005, the club was debt free. But since they bought the club on a leveraged deal, Man United have been in substantial debt and over £1 billion has left the club on interest repayments and on dividends. And as of 2019, the club still has over £500 million worth of gross debt. But what is the inside story of the Glazers? Because for a lot of United fans, they are the root of all the problems. To discuss that, I'm joined by The Athletic's Oliver Kay today to run through that. What is the inside story of the Glazers' ownership of United? Thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's, uh, it's a very good question because it's, it's a very deep question, so I hope we've got plenty of time. <laughs> it's it's it really with, with United right now. It, it, we're in such a state that I think questions like this need to be asked and discussed. Now, uh, as I said, Ollie writes for the Athletic, former chief correspondent of the Times. But the Athletic, United People's TV, are partnered with the Athletic, and right now you can get a thirty day free trial and fifty percent off an annual subscription. There is a link in the description. And what I'm going to be talking about and focusing on today is Ollie's column that he wrote on the Glazers and also wrote another column after the 1-0 defeat to Newcastle on Solskjaer too. So I'll be discussing both of those. But The Athletic has a world-class team of writers, including Ollie, David Ornstein, Andy Mitten, Laurie Whitwell, loads over there, completely ad-free. So follow the link in the description. But let's get into the chat today, Ollie, because your piece, look at the title, it was called Every Problem at Manchester United Leads Back to the Top. Now, was there a specific reason you chose that as the title of, of your piece? Or is it sort of a sum of all the problems at United at the moment? Well, it was, it was the first column I'd, I'd written, sort of opinion column I'd written for the, um, for the Athletic. It was straight after the West Ham game. And I, I, I wanted to sort of get stuck into the, 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 the main issues at Manchester United and I mean, you look at United at the moment, and there are so many issues. You can you can question Solskjaer's judgment. You can question the ability of some players, the attitude of other players. You can question just about everything: transfer policy, players in, players out, contracts renewed, contracts not renewed. Um, but to me, everything comes back from back to or stems from. The the Glazers the the mismanagement of the club over the last well it's probably uh, the, over the last six years since Ferguson's retirement that that has really begun to bite but the Glazers ownership of United is a massive handicap it was a handicap when as Man City fans were you know were saying you know you you know you signed Phil Jones we signed Kun Aguero that, that that summer of 2011 when City were just strengthening summer after summer. And United lost Ronaldo, lost Tevez, aging team. They were replacing players on the cheap, and they were getting away with it because Ferguson was a genius. And um, as soon as Ferguson left, all of those issues have come home to roost because there's been no strategy, football strategy, whatsoever. There's been no succession plan. There's been a well, I was going to say no coherent transfer policy, but we've probably had. Um, seen sort of four or five different really reactive wild erratic transfer policies o over that period and a squad now which is sort of thrown together by sort of three or four different managers not none of whom really gave the impression that they were really building with a sense of purpose and vision and and plan and so you can you know when people say well who's to blame are the players to blame? Yeah. Are the managers to blame? Yeah. But there is so much blame to go round because so much is going going wrong. And I, I would put an enormous amount of the blame on on the Glazers for the for the impact that they've had, negative impact they've had on the club's finances, and for the complete lack of proper management of of a football club. Because you see other clubs, you see Manchester City, obviously. United fans are able to say, "Well, look, at least we're not being used as a as a pawn for a for a sort of questionable regime, which which is the case for City. That 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 is what that ownership model is. But in terms of decision making, in terms of strategy, in terms of you know just a, a sort of a regime which puts football at the front of it and makes great football decisions, City of 
City have set an example. Liverpool have followed that example. United have. I don't even know what to say about United's decision making, but it's 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 terrible, and it's terrible because football is not the priority for that regime, and it never has been. And for the first eight years, they got away with it because they had Ferguson there. And for the last six years, they've been paying the price for horrendous decision making year after year. And obviously, the man who United fans aim most of their scorn towards is Ed Woodward. And you do discuss him in quite a lot of detail. Now, Ed Woodward was, I suppose, responsible for Van Hal coming in and then Mourinho, and now he's gone for Solskjaer. The thing with Woodward is we all know he's not a football man, but he's in control of the football in decisions. Is that still really is is that still the case? Has his power changed at all at United? Is he is he getting less responsibility after what is ultimately six years of a massive, massive in, in any sort mm. of other job, Woodward would have got sacked already. But because he helped the Glazers buy the club on the leverage deal, he was the accountant that brought it through. He's he's sort of their their puppy and they don't want to get rid of him. But has his power changed at United at all, or is he still the man in control of all the decisions when he shouldn't be? Well, to, to answer the bit about um, about you know, would he have been sacked in any other industry? Well, I think I think the reason the reason why his position is is pretty much unchallenged at United is because for the wood you know wood, the Woodward so the Glazers are incredibly loyal to him, but the, the Glazers are happy with the job that he does because football isn't the Glazers' priority, and, and I'm, I'm sure we can go into his his impact on the commercial side later on but because we spoke about that off camera but it's um i mean his, his there's never been any questions raised internally i don't think about about um about woodward's influence uh, apart from the fact that over the last 12 months or so there has been a recognition from woodward himself and i don't know whether that's sort of something that's been put to him by the Glazers. I doubt it because I don't even think they pay close enough attention. But I think there's been a recognition by Woodward himself that he needs more expertise around him so that there's not just this vast gulf between manager and, and executive vice chairman so that there's more football knowledge, expertise in the structure. So his position has been changed slightly. I mean, not not in terms of his role, but, but, but the but the... The structure has changed slightly in that the he sort of built this committee of people around him, which includes uh, John Murto, who's who's head of, head of performance or head of development, something like that. One of those sort of modern football club titles. There's Marcel Bout, who was um, uh, Van Hal scout. There's uh, Mick Court, who's a sort of long-serving analyst type scout who's gone up through the ranks um Solskjaer himself Nicky Butt um Mike Phelan has an input they've been con- leaning on or consulting people like Rio Ferdinand and Darren Fletcher and Patrice Ever at various times ex-players so there's been more of a kind of committee-based approach which I think works for works at Liverpool where they've got Klopp and they've got Michael Edwards and a lot of very good scouts who are all um, sort of singing from the same hymn sheet there. But I think everybody, well, look, I've, I've been saying this for at least five years, I think six years, I've been saying for, from from the Moyes time, they need a director of football. If any, if ever you could say that a club needed a director of football, it, it's, it's, it's this one because having previously had everything kind of, you know, Ferguson just ran everything and delegated bits and, you know, there's stuff about how stuff came out in, in Moises for in Moises season about how you know there wasn't really a bank of knowledge. It was all it was all up there, and it was all sort of expertise that had been um, that, that was in people's minds, but but there wasn't like a kind of computer bank of knowledge. And and they've gradually tried to clear, change that over the six years. But I think if you look at United's transfer policy and over that time, it's very often been Woodward reacting to agents telling him this player is available, that player is available. And there's a reason why Manchester City and Liverpool and Real Madrid and Bayern Munich and Barcelona, and the, the, the well-run big clubs, haven't gone for those players and or, or have balked at certain 
demands by agents and by players and and by rival clubs. So United have just been making it up as as they go along. And this summer, with this new, slightly new setup, there was evidence that they were a little bit more thoughtful in some of the decisions made. I I wouldn't rave about the deals that they did in terms of the prices, but it was it looked a bit um, it looked more thought out, but. It's still Woodward really calling the shots. So he's got this committee of people around him, and it's sort of being talked about as a more collegiate, holistic type approach. But it's nothing like what they've had in place for several years at Manchester City and at Liverpool. And I think you also got to wonder whether the quality of the people making the decisions in all of those roles is the same as is in those clubs. But the, this is what I, I find really strange about this whole director of football because you've seen the impact that Michael Edwards has had at, at City, uh, sorry, at Liverpool, and City have got the most phenomenal football structure that came in and Pep Guardiola, yeah. Guardiola just sat in a bed that was made for him. At United, last year, fans were told, we're looking for a director of football. We're actively looking. Yet a year on, United still don't have one. And I'm not convinced that that's because we haven't found the right one. For me, it, it, from the outside looking in, it's almost like Woodward doesn't want to relinquish his control. Uh, do United really intend to actually get a director of football? Or is it all just a bit of lip service to sort of appease the fans who want change at the club? What do you think? Um, I think they've, they've slightly changed their view on it. I think, I think around the time, sort of late Mourinho time, because they, were feel, they felt that Mourinho was sort of hard to control and was... was I think they felt like they needed to start planning for life after Mourinho, even towards the end of that final summer of 2018. So there were, talk, there were talks about getting somebody in at that time. And there were talks about, you know, once Mourinho had been sacked in December, there was this statement of, well, we're going to spend um, the next few months looking at a, a proper process, and looking for the next manager. And it came out quite um, clearly in, I can't remember whether it was ever said on the record, but it was certainly said in briefings um, to the media that yeah, uh, that kind of appointment was was very much um, something they were planning. And it didn't have to be, you know, it didn't have to be called a director of football. It could be sporting director, technical director, or whatever. It, you know, it, it's you know, you've, I think I, I was told the other day that it was there are 32 of the 92, 91 um, current. Premier League and football league clubs have that role in in, in their structure, and it's under a ver- you know it's under a variety of different um, titles. But um, it's it then began to come out. You know, they, they they did look at options. I don't know whether anybody was actually offered the job, but if you know, if they, they should be looking at somebody like Michael Zork, who's at Dortmund, who's who, who does a phenomenal job there, um, and has has done for many years. I don't know whether he'd would you get him? And I suspect not, because I think if if you could, he would probably have been lured away before now. But um, but you know, there are so many good ones, and there are so many um, good people who could just bring a, a weight of knowledge, expertise, vision, contacts, um, efficiency in, in football decisions. Um, and it's it's really baffling that they've not really brought that in, and they've got you know they've, they've promoted various people from within, but it was previously felt by them, never mind by people like me and you, that they didn't have enough expertise in the structure. So just by giving John Moto a bit more uh, influence, or Marcel Bout, or Mick Court, and just you know I, I don't think that has I don't think that is the answer. I don't think that was the answer. I don't think that will ever be. The answer. The one line that's come out, out over the past few months from people inside the club is that you know just getting that person isn't suddenly some silver bullet solution. You look at other clubs who have had a director of football and it doesn't it doesn't always work. And that's 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 true. And and you know not all managers want to work with that sort of structure. But it came out when when they were sort of discussing the permanent job with Solskjaer that he wanted Mike Phelan to have that kind of role and I don't think Mike Phelan would have been a world class director of football but I also don't think he would be a world class assistant manager I think if if that would have been something that Solskjaer would have been comfortable with um, 
you know, maybe that was a better use of Mike Feeler. Maybe that would, maybe that, but it does bother me where you've got a club where there is so little football, there are so few sort of senior roles for football people. You know, you look at City and they've got layer upon layer of technical, you know, um, scouting, recruitment type expertise. They've got so many people in so different, so many different roles. So even if, you know, if United have brought in somebody like Edwin van der Sar, whose role is, is, it's largely a commercial role in, in at Ajax, so you'd think it might appeal to um, Woodward. But even if you brought him in and said, well, okay, look, we're making you general manager. You're not, you're not director of football. You're not calling all the shots, but you are bringing a, you know, you, you, we want you to sort of help us set out this vision. But that's surely better than the, the people setting the vision, just reporting to Ed Woodward and it being Ed Woodward setting the vision. Because, you know, of, of all the conclusions that could be drawn about the last six, seven years, uh, Manchester United, the main one, well, the absolute undeniable one, is that Ed Woodward is not the man to be setting out Manchester United's vision on the pitch for the next, well, seven months, never mind the next seven years. But it's a long-term job. It needs serious football knowledge, football vision, acumen, expertise, contacts. And to me, they still haven't got that within the structure. It's absolutely extraordinary. That two words you've used there are extraordinary and baffling and it <laughs> I agree with both of those because it's not as if you have to be a rocket scientist to look at Man United and see where the clear problems are in the club and obviously part of that comes down to I think negligence of, of, of a job role that they're not doing properly properly sorry but as you say the Glazers are happy with Woodward's role because the revenues have been increasing Man United are making more money than ever, but in the last 12 months, the share price has dropped 25%. And although Gla although the Glazers and Woodward would always say that on the pitch, success does not necessarily relate to commercial success, there's a direct correlation in the downturn that we've seen in the last 12 months and the downturn in the share price of United. Do you think that's going to be something that moves the needle with the Glazers and maybe makes them think differently in terms of how the setup is with Woodward? Or is it just going to be a a small blip that they feel will recover in time? Well, they are businessmen. They're cold-hearted businessmen. I think they have some kind of warmth towards um, Woodward. Um, um, but I, mean, I, I wouldn't really fix fixate upon the, the share price because this, the share price can, you know, there are so many factors that can dictate that and it's sometimes, you know, little a little movement sends a a little tremor or a big tremor on the stock market it's not i wouldn't really focus so much on the share price as i would share i would focus on the way that united's financial growth although it's you know it continues and it's great from the glazers point of view their growth over the last few years hasn't been like liverpool's financial growth or juventus's growth or other clubs which are getting things right on the pitch um, for to, to say that United's commercial operation is booming is look they make more money commercially than any other Premier League club. I can't remember whether they currently make more or currently make less than 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 Real Madrid. I, it's it's always been sort of nip and tuck that, but it's but Real Madrid. Well, look, a, a successful Real Madrid would be making more money than they than they currently are. A successful Manchester United would be making more money than they currently are. In terms of, I mean, that, you know, there are the basic things in terms of, you know, contracts which have Champions League stipulations and, and bonuses for being in the Champions League. But there, are, it's just obvious that if you've got, I mean, they talked about the uplift, commercial uplift of signing Pogba and signing Ibrahimovic and the sort of superstar signings, even Di Maria and Falcao, although they didn't work, that, that they were described as signings which had a commercial impact even if they didn't have an impact on the on the pitch but if you have those kind of signings or even just even just you know a tier below that if you get signings that you develop into superstars like united did with ronaldo like you know, like liverpool are doing with mo salah and people like that if you if you're scouting people and recruiting players and they become superstars at your team 
then that's where the glaze you know that's where you will get a commercial boom and i i if if part of the glazers pitch and woodward's pitch to sponsors and commercial partners in the in the far east and all over the world over the last sort of 10 years was oh look you want to be associated with this brand because it's success it's glamour it's it's superstar players you look at these this current team and it's it's none of them i mean pogba is a guy with a big global reputation and you know i'm sure he's recognizable on billboards in beijing or tokyo or bangkok or, or wherever and great so is De Gea, but it's not I, I would think that even even look i hate it when people sign players for commercial reasons i really do but they've stopped doing that and they've stopped even signing players who are sort of potentially top top class players in, in in my opinion the last two summers has been you know it's been a bit more uh well it's been a bit, a bit more sort of mediocre in terms of the the, the players they signed and I, I do like some of them but it, but it's not top top class signings in my opinion and so you've seen you know the commercial side of things slow down and I think that's partly lack of success partly not being in the Champions League partly lack of you know, players that you would that sponsors would be desperate to to get behind and I really hate it I really hate even suggesting that the commercial side the sponsorship side is should be an important part of the what the fans care about but when people say oh well the 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 glazers and the woodward are, woodward are doing a great job commercially i don't think they are because I think to to maximize united commercially you you have to maximize what they are on the pitch and that's been shown with united's big booms with real madrid's big booms with liverpool's big boom now with juventus's big boom and it's I don't even think they're ticking that box currently. Well, United definitely aren't ticking the box in terms of on the pitch at the moment. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is under increasing pressure and that 1-0 defeat to Newcastle has sort of brought a lot of the frustration among United fans to the surface. You, You yourself wrote a column on Solskjaer and a lot of people are now going to be saying, look, Solskjaer is out of his depth, he's clearly not ready for the job. He can't be the one to bring us that on the pitch success. Do, do you feel that sacking Solskjaer is is a sort of, as you said earlier, the silver bullet, the solution for United that can move us forward, or is it a case of after the failures of Moyes and Van Gaal, Mourinho, that United really do just have to try and stick to their man, stick to their plan, and get through the rough patch and hope that on the other side of it, the grass is greener. Um, I, I I do find this difficult because. I, Solskjaer, I, I love the idea of Solskjaer being United manager, and I'm a sort of sentimentalist like that. I, I love the idea of 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 a, an ex player restoring those values which which are lost. And I love the fact that he came, he, he arrived in December, put smiles on faces, gave everyone a spring in their step, sounded like a Manchester United manager. You know, even in even in his dealings with us in press conferences, he just thought, God, he said more things that sound like a Manchester United manager in that one press conference than the previous three managers have said in, in six years. And and that is important. You need somebody who understands what the, what the, the club should stand for. Um, I don't think the three previous managers did understand that, did grasp that or did care about it in the, in the case of <laughs> um, Mourinho or Van Gaal. They, they, they just had their own, sort of ideas that, that belief that that they knew best and and I don't think they did but but um I do I, I even sort of mid February when they were playing brilliantly and and March um after PSG I I did say look this is great but we we don't know how good a manager Solskjaer is yet I I, I said you know the board. The one good thing the board have done in the recent in recent years is give, say we're going to take our time on this, and and they need to do that and judge him not on the first five results, not on the first ten results, not even not you know PSG that, that was a freak game, wasn't it? And and um, they played in a heroic manner in some ways that was completely unimaginable three months earlier, but it was you know the. 
they did get lucky at times in that run. And I, I thought it was really rash, really, really rash to just say, right, Solskjaer's the man, three-month contract, uh, three-year contract. Um, and I, I, didn't, I wasn't expecting things to tail off as dramatically as they did in the final months of last season or indeed in the first few months of this season. So despite having those reservations about the, the idea of a long-term appointment, I didn't expect it to be anything like this bad. Um, and I think what would worry me um, if I was a United fan would be that if, you know, you, you saw the very clear effect of Solskjaer coming in and lifting the mood. When I spoke to people at United around that time, I was saying, look, what's, you know, I was writing pieces about it, saying, what's changed? And it was, like, oh, the mood, everyone's spring their step, everybody. There was very little that was about um, what he was doing technically or tactically on the training ground. It, well, so I was intrigued as to what there would be once that initial new broom effect wore off. And I don't think there's much in Solskjaer's background as a manager to suggest that he's a top-class coach or motivator or visionary or strategist or, or any of that. Um, and I was probably hoping that... I mean, well, look, to be, to be honest, I think United, with everything they lack elsewhere in the club and with the, the problems that they have in the dressing room and in the boardroom and the, the gap between dressing room and boardroom... Um, I think they need to be managed by somebody who is absolutely top class at, at, at all of those things, to, can set out a vision, can motivate players brilliantly and can get the absolute best out of players on the training pitch week after week. And I quite like the, the, the idea of the vision that he set out about sort of going back to basics, younger players, getting a few more British players and people who perhaps understand who you know I, I like the one Bissaka signing I like Daniel James I thought Harry Maguire was crazily overpriced but I you know I, I understood that deal um so I, I didn't really have a major criticism of the three signings they made in the summer I just thought there should have been more in it and out but I would I do have real doubts about what he's like as a coach or a manager because I look at them the last two months of last season and the first two months of this season and I struggle to even work out what they've what they're meant to look like as a team. You don't, I, I don't think they look like they're a very well coached team. So although I absolutely say that the the main problems are higher up and there are, there are problems in the dressing room, do I think that Solskjaer is the solution to those problems? Mm, I've got my doubts. Well, I think I think everybody's got doubts about pretty much every department of United at the moment. There's, mm. there's not one area where you can say, not even on the pitch, there's not one area on the pitch, there's not one area off the pitch where you can say that United are in a good and stable condition. That's why no. this rebuild really is so phenomenal in, in scale and it's just it's been made worse by everything that's happened and compounded every year since Fergie retired. But to go back to the Glazers, obviously for United fans, as you said, like the... the there was a lot of underinvestment towards the end yeah. under Fergie, but he was such a brilliant manager that he he sort of brushed over that. And it wouldn't have worked under anybody else, but after Fergie left, this overinvestment that's sort of trying to make up for that underinvestment has been done badly and poorly because the wrong people are making those decisions. But in your opinion, what's what's coming next for United? You know, what should fans be expecting in the next couple of years? Should we be expecting more of the same or is it do you feel that United and the Glazers maybe are looking at it and saying, you know what, we do need success back on the pitch for our brand, which they own, to be more valuable, which is what they want. Do you think that those thoughts might align more in what United fans want to see or is it just going to be another sort of loggerheads with one part of the club going completely against another in the commercial and the football side of things? Um, well, I, d I don't think the, the signings that they made this summer were looked like they were commercially driven in the same way that some of the other pre the, the previous signings um, were. I don't think they looked reactive or agent driven in the way that some of the previous signings were. Um, there was the sort of Mino Raiola summer. There was the George Mendes summer, and I think this was a summer where decisions were being made with, you know 
purely with football in mind and I think that's uh, and there weren't major power struggles so look that's that's positive that's progress um but in terms I mean I I just thought going into this summer that they needed well to be honest I felt I felt it almost every summer that they need a massive turnover of players um sort of six or seven out six or seven in or or seven or eight out and six or seven in to me, there's there's so much dead wood at United. I mean, they got rid of Darmian and Herrera and Lukaku Sanchez um, in the summer. Valencia, so you know, senior players, big names, um, big wages. Um, to me, it, it looks. I mean, I, I thought they could have, should have gone further with that. Um, there's players there that I still can't believe are still there. Um, after all these years, and and um, it does feel like sort of mediocrity has often been rewarded with new contracts just because there's not been the imagination or the vision or the desire to to replace players with with better players. Um, so I, you know, this summer was probably the most turbulent that they've had in terms of players out, but I still think there should have been more, and there should definitely have been more players in and and further. I couldn't believe that it was just. Three players in. I mean, you know, they sold, got rid of Herrera and didn't sign a, a new midfielder. I would think they needed at least two midfielders. They needed at least two players for the front line. And I'm not talking about, you know, just people to make up the numbers. I think they need they need really really good players and not, you know, it, so when people are saying, well, they needed this is always going to take four or five transfer windows or whatever. Um, I'm pretty shocked by how sort of complacent and slow the approach to this summer's transfer window was because Maguire, yeah, as I say, I, I, I understood that signing even if I, even if I thought he was overpriced. Wan Bissaka, I like um, Daniel James. I, I've seen more of him at United than I'd seen previously, and I like what I see. I think he's got you know a good attitude, good potential, but. United squad is so thin, really, in terms of top quality. And if it's going to be that, you know, look, they they could have had they could have had more turbulence, more turmoil, and got more players out, more players in. And yeah, it would have been upheaval. But isn't upheaval what United needed? As it isn't upheaval what United have needed for the last four or five, six years? Instead of just sort of extending contracts without thinking about it, instead of um, thinking, oh, well, look, we're, we're sorted for that position because we've got this guy who's who's got a good reputation. And the, I just find it really, you know, baffling, extraordinary, those words again, that the people looked at that transfer window and thought, yeah, that's a good transfer window. Because you can make good decisions, but United needed to, needed to make loads of good decisions this summer, and they didn't. They made probably three or four good decisions and that's progress but they needed they needed to go at it you know it did call for revolution not evolution because what they've tried so far hasn't worked so to go into this summer with with no Lukaku and without having replaced him unless something was going to be unlocked in Rashford or Martial that was going to get turn them into 30 goal a season strikers then there was going to be a, a huge loss of goals from this team. And unless McTominay or Pereira was going to, you know, really, really improve massively, the, the midfielder was going to be weaker, not stronger for, for what they did in the summer. So I just think, yeah, it's going to take time. And United fans, I think, accept that. But to me, they've made that process slower by not being more ambitious and ag- aggressive in the in the transfer market. I think every United fan knew for the last like three, four years we needed a central midfielder and we haven't, and that's clearly a massive problem. But for, for United fans now, we're, we're at a, I feel like we're at a massive crossroads because we've had three managers who have ultimately failed and a fourth who is failing and they're all completely different types of managers with all completely different types of signings. Mm. It's a bad situation that, that might get worse before it gets better. But for United fans that don't want the Glazers 
in charge of our club anymore and that's going to be 99.9% .9 of us. Can we expect any sort of change? Obviously, Liverpool, the ownership changed there with uh, Hicks and they obviously got Fenway Sports Group came in and they made a massive difference. Michael Edwards came in. There are similarities to the, to the problems that Liverpool were having and, and aren't having anymore because they've made the changes. And now look at what they're doing on the pitch with the right manager and the right signings. I, I, it, 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 it makes it worse for United fans for the fact that it's Liverpool and City <laughs> who both seem to be getting it so right. Yeah, we're yeah. getting it so wrong. Can we expect that sort of change to happen at our club, or do you think that United are just going to do it differently? Well, I would look more at. Um, I mean, the, the ownership of Liverpool. Um, what was it? Now it's it was two thousand seven to two thousand ten. So it was, that was a three year period. They came in. They were absolutely disastrous. They did spend a little bit of money. Well, they spent a bit of money um, the first summer, but they they. They were just completely. They were hands on in a very aggressive, chaotic way, and that and, and that sort of brought all kinds of problems. Which the Glazers, being completely hands off and so aloof from it, you know, it was, it was the opposite kind of problems. There were financial problems too because they they were uh, taking on loans that they couldn't afford to repay, and the club couldn't afford to repay. So that was a that all came to a head remarkably quickly. I would draw more of a parallel with the Arsenal situation because, you know, Stan Kroenke bought Arsenal very hands-off, very complacent, didn't really care as long as things were ticking over. Things stopped ticking over, um, stopped qualifying for the Champions League, needed to change manager, which um, needed to ch update the whole structure. Um, and they suddenly became, having seemingly not cared, uh, about the flack that they were getting. They suddenly started caring about the flack that they were getting because they knew that it was having an impact on the brand, on the team, you know, on probably on their lives. You know, um, Josh Cronkey, Stan Cronkey's son came over to um, to England and spent a few months there and he sort of reported back, look, that things are really bad. The mor morale of the fan base is really low. The morale all around the club is really low. We need to make changes here. And they've, they have spent the last two years really sort of trying to update and, and change the structure and it doesn't happen overnight it's not an easy thing to do when you've when you've when you're needing a completely new structure to return to liverpool they d appointed a director of football damian camoli they appointed a new manager kenny dalglish they had a new transfer strategy it was all sort of you know, everyone was talking about money ball and then they buy Andy Carroll for 35 million and they buy Stuart Dowding and Charlie Adam and people that didn't work. They also bought Luis Suarez, so it wasn't all bad. Um, within about a year or 18 months, they were appointing a new, you know, it was a completely new structure, completely new um, everything else. And I think that's what happens when you, you know, Everton needed, a, felt they needed a director of football, appointed Steve Walsh, sacked him after, what, a year or two because of, you know, they, they didn't rate the players he was getting in, didn't rate decisions he was made. They now have Marcel Brantz, who you know, comes with a very good reputation um, in Holland and has made some interesting decisions, good decisions, um, probably made some bad ones as well. And it, it's not, as, as people at United have told me, it's not a silver bullet. But Arsenal have, have gone about it in a way that, you know, they've, they appointed Raul Sanyehi, who's who's a sort of he's doing that sort of Matt Judge um, stroke Woodward role of trying to grease the wheels and and you know work move things along in terms of negotiating deals and he has an expertise in that he has the contacts which Ed Woodward doesn't have or didn't have Matthew Judge doesn't have um, they have appointed a, a sort of head of recruitment. Ben Mislintat, who's from Dortmund, and those, I mean, it, it's, he left within about a year, having made some sort of appealing, interesting signings, Gwendouzi and, and Leno and Aubameyang, and um, it shows that even if you do go, you embrace that structure, it's not going to happen overnight, it's going to probably take, there are going to be teething problems, personality clashes, you might need to find two or three, but United need to go in that direction and go in the direction that pretty much every 
club of any kind of ambition has gone in because you, managers are no longer what Ferguson was, the sort of autocrat who oversees everything and has the, you know, everybody reports into him. A manager now is a head coach and Solskjaer, we don't know whether he's even a good enough head coach, but I certainly don't think he's, he's somebody who has the, the power and the knowledge and the vision to be all of those things in the way that Ferguson was and the way that Van Hal wanted to be but couldn't be and Mourinho wanted to be but couldn't be. So this is going to take time for United and especially when, I mean, to me, they they kind of chickened out of some big decisions um, with, with this year. They didn't get a direction of football. They made the very easy decision with the management, you know, with the manager, they they went for the guy who who was the caretaker who was going well. Which, look, to me, it seemed like ninety percent of the fans wanted to by February March, so it would have been difficult not to. But I think they should have taken their time more, and just if they were going to appoint him, appoint somebody who could, you know, be that director of football as well, so that you could. Um, even if things went wrong quickly with Solskjaer, that there was already a succession planning happening. Whereas in the structure that they have, Solskjaer is part of that sort of long-term planning and, and you're not, you're not going to get that succession planning because I don't think there's the expertise within the structure. So I think this, um, you know, they were, they've been at a crossroads for a long time and I think they've probably gone in the wrong direction repeatedly. And they reached another crossroads, going to, and, and it's probably going to take a long time to get back to the point where they're really progressing in, in a position where Liverpool and City are. Uh, I wish I could disagree, but <laughs> you can't really. United are years. I, th- I think that's a, a, a pretty interesting comparison you made there with Arsenal. I hadn't really thought about that, but the Cronkers certainly have become a little bit more central than... They, they were previously. Whether Avram and Joel start to do that at United remains to be seen, but I very, very much doubt it, given they've done a very similar thing with Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah, yeah. But United are a shadow of what we were previously. Uh, and as we, you've discussed here in some detail today, the problems at the club really are quite substantial. And it, the, to use that word again, baffling that it hasn't already been sorted. But all United fans can do is hope that things will change because there were positives this summer. I will agree with that. Mm. We needed more, but they were steps in the right direction, whereas previously we've just been steps in the wrong direction. On the pitch, we're all over the place. and I don't really know what's going to be changing in the short term there, but thank you very much for talking today with me, Ollie, about the Glazers, about Ed Woodward, some interesting ideas and concepts there about Solskjaer and what's next for United. But I don't think it's going to be very pretty the rest of the season whether Solskjaer is still in charge or not let's see but Woodward has said that he won't be distracted by short term distractions let's find out if Solskjaer is manager at the end of the season though but can, as can, I said, can, I, can I just say I, yeah. I mean there's, there's one thing that strikes me with that decision and, and people are saying you know you can't just make short term decisions you can't make knee joke decisions and you need to trust the, the vision the long term direction I, I just would worry, as if I were a United fan, that that decision was precisely a short-term knee-jerk decision. And I totally understood the reasons for it. But to me, they, you know, talking about that long-term strategy and talking about um, the, needing, the need to go in that direction, I, I think it's... And giving Solskjaer time... Look, every, every United fan will want to give... Solskjaer time and, and I and want it to work out and I think everybody in the media wants it to work out because I think you know everybody likes him everybody likes the idea of him being the the guy who takes United back but it's just it's it's another Ed Woodward decision and I don't think those decisions have ever been the right ones and I don't think giving Ed Woodward decisions more time has ever been the solution and I don't think giving Ed Woodward more time as making those decisions is a, is a solution. So I, I think it's I think sooner or later it will come to the stage where the people are thinking, well, okay, what do we need to do next? And I, it's going to be something that needed to do to be done 
six years ago, which is which is get real expertise in in making those decisions and and getting a, a manager who is proven in terms of developing players and is developing teams, young players rebuilding for the long term, and a manager who's on the up in the way that Klopp was when Liverpool appointed him, Guardiola, rather than a manager who is on the way down or out of his depth or just unsuited to what Manchester United need. And I don't think United have... I, did, I've no, I haven't agreed with any of the appointments that have been made so far. So it, that's why, it's, for me, it's difficult to say, give, give them more time. Man, it's a tough time, <laughs> tough time to be a United fan, but you know, I can't really disagree with anything you've said. But um, as always, let me know in the comments what you think about all the points that Oli has had to raise. Uh, if you are new to United People's TV, make sure you subscribe and also make sure you follow the link in the description to go over to Athletic to read Oliver's columns. But Oli, thank you very much for your time today. I hope you're wrong on a lot of what you said, but <laughs> I don't really think you are. Thank you. 